The best way to do that is probably how a doctor does when he is diagnosing a patient. And the way a doctor, a good doctor, will do this, and probably you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you go about by that by ruling out what it can't be, right? You do some tests, and you rule this out, rule that, not that, it's not that, it's not cancer. Thank God it's not cancer, right? You rule out this, you rule out that. And, and that's the way you hone in on what it really is. You rule out. And so what we're going to do is try to rule out. And by that one text, we've ruled out about 37,500 of the 38,000 denominations. Uh, they are a commandment-keeping church, and they keep all of God's commandments. And that leaves about uh, 510, maybe a little bit more now, 510 Sabbath-keeping churches. Are you aware that we're not the only one here that keep the Sabbath? There's 510 of them. Four of some of the more notable ones are the Seventh-day Baptists. You've probably heard of those. We've seen some of their churches out here. They have about 50,000 members in 22 countries. Uh, out of the 220 countries of the world, there's, they're in about 22 of them. There's the Church of God Seventh Day. Maybe you've heard of that one. It's a little bigger. It has 125,000 members in 21 countries. So uh, that's a, a pretty significant group there. There's the United Church of God. And the, the population census on that is a little fuzzy, but uh, I guess it's 20,000 people. But reportedly, they lost half of their members in 1990. I think, do uh, you remember the, I think it was the Radio Church of God when, what's that? Armstrong, yes, that's right. Armstrong's Church of God. They had a little uh, falling out when Herbert Armstrong left and his son took over. Didn't they uh, had a big split there. About half the members left, if I got the story right, in 1990s. Now, the Seventh-day Adventist Church um, has about a little over 16 million members. That sounds like a big number, but in the scope of things, when you consider there are 2.5 billion Christians in the world, it's actually a pretty small number. It's a little less, less than half of 1%. It's not really a big church compared to, like, say, the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has about half the population. 50% of the Christian population is in the Catholic Church. So, but does size mean anything? Size is not really a determining factor. Are we looking for the church that's true based on the size? Didn't Jesus say broad is the road that leads to destruction? And how many find that one? The Bible, Jesus says many find that one, but narrow, he says narrow is the road that leads to life. And how many find that road? He said few find that road. Only a few. It's a, it's a narrow road that leads to life. And James 2.10, I think we visited this once before, but here it says again, Whoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in just one point, he's guilty of how much? He's guilty of all. So, so far, we're, we're ruling out some churches here. And we'll go to uh, answer B. Answer B, it will be a worldwide movement preaching God's end-time messages. And that's based on a scripture that Jesus left us in uh, Matthew 24, verse 14. He says... And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Doesn't mean everybody's going to believe it, right? But this, the gospel, the true gospel, is going to go to everybody in the whole world and unto all nations, and then the end will come. I like that. This is the only scripture that we have that actually pinpoints the end of time, Christ's second coming. This is the closest you're going to get to finding a scripture that nails down when the second coming is. Now, to, um, to have an organization that would go to all the world, you need to have a, quite a bit of, of, of organization in that, in, in unity, right? And um, there's only really two churches that uh, we, we can rule out almost everybody now. We're down to like two churches that are actually in all the world right now. It's the Catholic Church, which isn't surprising, right? And the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Are you aware that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in... 205, I think, countries of the 220 countries of the world, and some of them that they're not in, they're, 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 the radio's there, we've got satellites going in there, uh, we've got television networks blanketing the globe right now, and internet, of course, internet, internet you can't exclude uh, very easily, right, especially if you have a satellite, but uh, about 205 of the 220 countries, and like Saudi Arabia, Christianity is illegal in some of these countries, there's Seventh-day Adventists there. China, did you know China? Many parts of China, it's illegal. But there's Seventh-day Adventists there. There's the, uh, the, uh, our, our radio program. The Adventist World Radio is going all through China now. But the uh, only other church that comes close to having a, a presence like this in all the world is the Catholic Church. 
Are you aware there are more missionaries uh, in the Adventist church than any four other Protestant churches combined? Just pick out any four of you want. Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran. You can combine them all together. We've got more missionaries in, these, in other parts of the world than four of them combined. We're baptizing about 3,000 people a day. By now, 2,800 people to 3,000 people every single day. That's a growing, it's a world, that sounds like Pentecost, doesn't it? How many were baptized on Pentecost? 3,000 in a day. That's happening every day in the church now. Mark 16, 15, Christ says, this is a beautiful scripture, Go ye into all the world. This is a great commission, isn't it? To, and preach the gospel to every creature. And so it would, it would take some organization. God is asking his true church to go into all the world and preach to everybody. Don't just limit it to 21 countries, 22 countries. And that's nice to be there. But God's true church is going to have a presence worldwide. Amen? Let's go to answer C. God's true church will have all the spiritual gifts, including the gift of prophecy. Amen? Now, where do you find the spiritual gifts in the Bible? Does anybody, or you A students, do you know where the spiritual gifts are found in the Bible? Yeah, 1 Corinthians 12. You can find them in Ephesians 4 also. But, but uh, the Bible lists in 1 Corinthians 12, and I think it's 20, verse 28, it says uh, the church was given gifts. First, the, gift, the first gift was apostles, and some are, secondly, prophets, and teachers, miracles, healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Right? These are spiritual gifts listed in order, and God's true church, according to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 7 and 8, will have all these spiritual gifts in place. So that you come behind in how many gifts? He's talking about the church, no gifts. Don't become behind, in, don't be lacking in any gifts, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you until how long? So this is telling us that God's spiritual gifts, all of God's spiritual gifts, not, don't come behind any, any of them, they'll be in place in God's true church all the way till the end of time. Amen? Ah, God's, this is uh, all the way to the second coming. Ephesians 4, and verse 11, it's not on your screen, but it says uh, these gifts will be in place till we come to the unity of faith, right? So, and then Revelation 12, verse 17, the Bible says the remnant of her seed, speaking of God's true church, which keep the commandments and, of, of God, and, very important, not only do they, do they keep the commandments, but they have the testimony of Jesus. Is that ever, does that mean that, that, that they say, they go out and tell people about Jesus? That they say, I believe in Jesus. Because every church says that, right? We all believe in Jesus, amen? Well, what is this testimony of Jesus? Spirit of prophecy, let's take a look. Uh, you know the Bible interprets itself, right? We learned that. In our first lesson, the Bible interprets itself. And here's a classic example. The testimony of Jesus uh, is the spirit of prophecy. Isn't this, this, is a, this is where we're wondering, what is that testimony of Jesus? Well, you go to Revelation 19, it says it's the spirit of prophecy. So God's true church will have the gift of prophecy. Can a, a prophet be a woman? Acts 2, verse 17, very clearly in the Bible, it says... It shall come to pass in the last days, here's Peter, the apostle speaking, he says, your sons and your daughters. Now, I have, I've got two daughters, and last time I checked, they were both girls. Does that make sense? They were girls. I've got boys and girls. I've got daughters and sons. The daughters are female. And when the Bible says that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, it's talking about women having the gift of prophecy. And there's a lot of examples of women prophets in the Bible, isn't there? We've got, in fact, I've got a whole list of them here for you. There's a lot more than just this, but Miriam. Remember Moses' sister, Miriam? Miriam was a prophetess. And there's a scripture, you can look that up. Exodus 15. Deborah was inspired to help conquer the Canaanites. She judged Israel. Not only was she uh, using the gift of inspiration to help guide God's people, she became, the, like, that's like the king in those days, a woman judging God's people. Israel was God's people. Here we have Isaiah's wife. Now you thought Isaiah was the only one. Can you imagine being married to a prophet if you were a prophet? Wow, what a neat family. I'd love to visit that family. Isaiah's wife was a prophet. A prophet. Huldah, well, I don't know if she was necessarily a prophet. I think she was, but she helped the priest uh, during the, the reign of Josiah. And Josiah is probably my favorite king besides King David. 
Uh, Anna, you remember Anna, that old lady that sat in the temple looking for the Messiah to come? The Bible says she was a prophet. She greeted our, our, the infant Lord. And then, on Paul's journeys, remember Paul the Apostle going around here and there with Luke and Silas and all those guys having a great time preaching the gospel? He ran into a fellow named Philip, and Philip had four daughters, each of which were prophets. Can you imagine? That would be a fun place to have dinner. Four prophets. All these daughters he had were prophets. So it's very biblical for a woman to be a prophet. Now, are there biblical tests to establish the validity of a true prophet? Well, there are probably a good 10 or 11, but for, uh, for time's sake, I don't have them up on the screen, but we remember some of these texts. Isaiah 8, verse 20 is probably your, your, main, uh, your main scripture to go to in order to establish the validity of a prophet. True prophet says to the law, you know this one, and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, now that's this word right here, right? The law and the prophets, the law and the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, how much light is in them? There is no light in them. Deuteronomy 18.22, it says, if the thing that they predict, a prophet predicts something, and it doesn't come to pass, what happens to the validity of that prophet? He says, he is, that, it, that is not, my, that I have not sent this person. False prophet. You remember, I think, someone named Jean Dixon in the, you know, I think, did she pass away by now? I'm not sure if she's still alive or not, but Jean Dixon uh, claimed to be a true prophet of God, and uh, they did a little study on her. She had an accuracy rating of about, I think it was as high as 33% at one time. 33% of the things she said came to pass. So she said, I'm a true prophet, you know, because she had a better record than, than Nostradamus, who was like 5% or something. But what happens when you, when you compare that to Deuteronomy 18? False prophet, Amen. Another good one is Jesus says, by their fruits, in Matthew 7, by their fruits you will know them. And so you've got to be a good fruit inspector. And the fruits are different than gifts. Fruits are love, joy, peace. We've studied those in many times. But love, joy, peace, long-suffering, you know, uh, all these wonderful things. Those are fruits of the Spirit. And every God, all God's people are supposed to have these. But you test a prophet by their, their fruits. And then John, 1 John, my favorite, 1 John 4, 2. You may want to write these down. They might be in your lesson, actually. Oh, they are, okay. So 1 John 4, verse 2, the Bible says, Every spirit that confesses Jesus is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses not is not of God. Now, does that mean all you have to do is say, I believe, I've confessed Jesus has come? Because Jean Dixon did that. She confessed Jesus, right? That's not what it's talking about. It means... Everything a true prophet says will be Christ-centered. You won't be predicting that uh, Elizabeth Taylor is going to get a divorce next, next year. Right? That has nothing to do with Jesus. Right? So based on 1 John 4, that prophet would fail the test because they made a prediction that has nothing to do with Jesus. It doesn't lead you to Jesus. Everything a true prophet does will have everything to do with Jesus. It will lead you to Jesus. It will uh, involve saving of souls. And so it will be Christ-centered. Now, is there a worldwide commandment-keeping church who has the gift of prophecy? So far, we've said, we've said they've got to be a worldwide movement. They've got to be commandment-keepers. And they've got to have the gift of prophecy. 